Welcome to the Town Talks, the show where students from Oakland Public Schools get to talk to Oakland icons. Our guest today is Oakland native and best-selling author Tommy Orange. Our host is Richie Nunez. Take it away, Richie. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, before we jump in, I actually just want to give uh, an expression of gratitude uh, to all the students in the stands. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, to Tommy Orange, thank you for your time. Uh, for the collaboration uh, between La Segunda, uh, KDOL, and OUSD, uh, thank you. Um, this is you know, obviously the author of There, There, and we're going to jump uh, right into the conversation. Uh, so how about you take us away with the first question? OK, so out of all the characters that you wrote about, which one did you most enjoy writing about? Enjoy is uh, maybe too much of um, a positive word for the writing process. Um, if it came out really fast, that's preferable. Um, and Thomas Frank, which is a, a pretty autobiographical chapter. My first name is Thomas, um, like my legal name is Thomas, my middle name is Frank. So I was sort of like admitting by calling that chapter Thomas Frank that it, it's, in a lot of ways it was me that I was writing about. And that came out like in 10 days. So if everything came out fast, I think I would like everything more, but uh, it's a bit of a process. Um, growing up, what were some of your favorite things to do in Oakland? Uh, so I grew up right near uh, Diamond Park and, um, you know, just going down to the park. Um, it was, we, we could walk two blocks and be there. That was a really nice thing. As a kid, I grew up on a street um, with like seven different kids my age. Um, so we didn't necessarily go very many places. Um, we would be at Diamond Park or, you know, on our street playing different sports or tag. Um, so I don't have, you know, the drive-in at the Coliseum I really liked. We, I used to go with uh, my best friend to that all the time. Uh, that's what comes to mind. Growing up in Oakland, did you practice any like hyphy movement? Uh, I'm gonna date myself here. That happened a little bit after, um, you know, if I was a younger person when that was going on, it, it probably would have affected me more. Uh, I'm 41 years old, so, um, by the time that happened, I was already kind of grown up, and uh, so I wasn't necessarily, I was like, I knew about it, and I, you know, I listened to it, but not in the same way, like as a young person, that it might have affected me. So at the time growing up in Oakland, what was affecting you, like what was popular? I mean, Too Short uh, was something that my sisters like really turned me on to in probably a really inappropriate way. <laughs> Just, you know, thinking back now as a father and everything. Um, I liked, you know, a mix of, of uh, I didn't know underground Oakland rap at the time, so that was like the closest thing. Um, I don't know that I was that aware of, of Oakland. I feel like Oakland, as I got older, uh, had more of an identity. Um, you know, I loved going to A's games and I was aware of the sports, the, the Raiders and, and the, the sort of sports persona of Oakland. But it didn't feel like it had a lot of these different movements that give it its identity. You know, you know I was, I loved Oakland because it's my home and I, all my friends and family were around. But I didn't, I don't feel like it had the same identity that it has now. Um, talking about Oakland and the culture of Oakland, who is your favorite artist out of Oakland, music artist? I don't think I, you know, I, I wasn't that into music when I was a kid. Um, and I wasn't that aware of, of any artists. I wasn't. I was into playing sports. Um, I wasn't a good student, and I and I wasn't really paying attention to any artists until I was like, you know, 18. I remember I was waiting for the bus, and some kids asked me, um, "What what music do you listen to?" And my answer was, and it's crazy looking back because I became a musician. I went to college for sound engineering, and I you know I love music, but at the time I was like, I don't really listen to music. Um, so I was, you know, I was kind of a weird kid. When you hit that 18 mark, like musically, who was that? What that inspired you? Um, you know, I started playing guitar and and um, piano, and I was making beats like with a drum machine. I was listening to a lot of uh, underground hip hop, so like Black Alicious and Jurassic Five um, were like early ones. Um, definitely hieroglyphics in high school. Uh, I started to become aware of of some Oakland underground rap. You're um, talking about how you got into music and 
how you play some instruments. So what are your favorite ones to play and which ones are your favorite ones to listen to? I don't think I have a favorite instrument to listen to, um, but I, I like to play the piano. Um, and uh, But that doesn't, you know, I don't listen to a ton of piano music. It's just um, if I'm going to play an instrument, that's the one I put the most time in on and have a, you know, the closest relationship to. In an interview that we watched on PBS News Hour, I recall you talked about how in high school you dealt with a lot of racism and people would call you like Asian racial slurs. And my question is like, since you're a father now, like, are you doing anything for your son to help shield him from going through what you went through? Sadly, um, I, so I ended up moving away from Oakland for many years. Uh, first to a town called Copperopolis. Um, it's like east of Stockton in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. Um, I moved, uh, that's where my wife grew up. And we lived up in the foothills and then further up the mountain uh, for many years. I just moved back to Oakland uh, last year. And my son ended up uh, getting a lot of racism up there because it's predominantly white and rural and kind of closed-minded people. Um, and I didn't really have any way to protect him from it. I definitely had ways to have conversations about it when he got home from school. But unfortunately, he faced some of that. And, and he is, uh, his, his mom is half Chinese, so he's, he is Asian. And he was uh, receiving some Asian hate, unfortunately. And he was super happy to be moving back to Oakland for the diversity. Uh, we just, for financial reasons, we couldn't afford Oakland at a time, and then it took us a while to be able to move back. Um, you've shared that your mother is white and your father is native. From your dad's side, what stories were you told as a child about natives? So the story we heard um, the most was uh, the Sand Creek Massacre. And he told it in a very specific way um, that he heard his grandmothers tell it. And uh, I didn't really th know why he was telling us until I got older, because um, there was this, there was a boy who saved a baby that day. And because he did that, they traded names. And what my dad was telling us uh, was uh, a naming story. This was how he got his, his Cheyenne name was this act the day of the massacre. So he wasn't telling us to emphasize the massacre, although it was devastating to our tribe. He was really just, you know, telling his naming story. And that was the one we probably heard the most. What was your favorite thing to do in Oakland and your least favorite thing to do growing up as a kid? Um, you know, like I said, we, we would, I would be home a lot because I had a lot of friends who lived on, on my street. Um, and so we would go down to get pizza, you know, on MacArthur. We used to, like, go around the neighborhood and, and um, ask people if they needed yard work or we washed their cars sometimes like way too many times within a short time period. And we'd get enough money to go down and, and play Street Fighter at, at the round table on MacArthur. Um, that was something that we loved to do during the summer. How did you struggle with your native identity in Oakland around the RH? Well, one of the things um, that's hard is when there aren't other native people around. And, uh, and so there in all of the schools I went to, there was only ever like one other kid my, in my class who was native. There was a kid Santino in elementary school, and there was this kid Billy, Billy Dorschkin in, in the seventh and eighth, and then at the same high school that I went to. Uh, so when you hear the way history is taught in school, usually in a really dumb way, um, or just ignorant or sanitized in a way that's harmful, um, and you know a certain kind of history from, from home, and you're not seeing other Native people around. You know, there, there's, a, there's an isolation um, that is painful. And, and, you know, when you're thinking about your identity and everything that's taught uh, everywhere you see Native people is only in history, it can feel like, you know, your people are already gone. Uh, of course, we'd go back to Oklahoma, where my dad grew up, and see family. and, and 
that was really good and made me feel like more belonging. But then fa even family there, cousins there, would sort of look down on us because we're from the city or because our mom is white. So, you know, it was, it was definitely a, it was a thing that, uh, that me and my sisters all experienced. It was a difficult thing. Going to the Coliseum, how do you feel about the fact that it might be vacated and the A's might leave Oakland? Yeah, it's sad. I, I loved the Coliseum. Um, and losing the Warriors is a, was a bigger blow because I like basketball way more um, than watching baseball. Uh, but it would be super sad to lose. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what they would do with it. Um, but let, yeah, I wouldn't be as sad as I was when we lost the Warriors. Um, what is it about sports? Like, what was it about sports that um, you know, brought you tranquility to drew you? I think uh, I think it was what I was encouraged to do. I think there was like a sort of like a you know masculine template. Like that was what you know that was what my dad encouraged me to do, and I was pretty good. And I wasn't necessarily encouraged to do well in school. That wasn't really a focus. Um, my mom was like crazy Christian evangelical, um, you know, like pretty intensely religious. And so there was an emphasis on, you know, spirituality um, and sports and not really like creativity or there was, we didn't, it wasn't a reading house. Like I, nobody in my house was reading books. So sports was like, I was good at it and I was encouraged to do it. So it was kind of like an easy choice. And then I got really into roller hockey after kind of like doing all the different sports. And, um, and at the time, there was a professional roller hockey team who played at the Coliseum called the Oakland Skates. So we used to go to games. Uh, I mean, that, there's an, a favorite thing that I used to do uh, was go to Oakland Skates games. Um, and, uh, you know, it seemed reasonable that, uh, that I could go pro um, as a kid. Yeah. And I got like sponsored when I was 16. So the company was giving me equipment and I was traveling the country. Um, so, you know, it, I was, I was encouraged to do it and I was, I was pretty good at it. And that's probably mostly what it was. Before we hop in, uh, I just, if we can just get a round of applause from the audience. Thank you to you. Thank you to Tommy for your time. Like if we just get a round of applause, please. Thank you. All right. So jumping into uh, the last Jumping into that la last round of questioning, uh, why don't you go ahead and take us away, Ashley. In your book, a lot of your characters deal with drug and alcohol abuse, and my question is, why do you think that affects the Native community so much, and why is this stereotype of them being alcoholics put on them? You know, I wrote about it uh, from a personal place. I wrote about it because I've experienced that in my family, um, and not, not out of, like, I wanted to represent or reinforce a stereotype, but just because it's personally affected me and my family. In a, you know, in the book, somebody talks about um, this, this special relationship that Natives supposedly have with alcohol, um, like we have a weakness for it. And that's the way it's been portrayed in the media. And it gets reinforced all the time. But uh, in the book, I, I say this, um, you know, it's, it's cheap, it's easy to get, it's legal. Uh, and it's, you know, addiction is so often a symptom of something else going on. And Native people experienced a lot of loss and a lot of trauma um, and still do today. And that's one of the ways that, that we have coped in the past. If you look at, you know, what's affecting Native people right now, it's probably fentanyl and probably meth or whatever is easiest to get and, and it's going to, you know, treat whatever they're trying to treat. Uh, but it's always something deeper. And, and you know, I, I tried to write through the stereotype and to bring that up and not reinforce it. But, but I was also working with material that unfortunately has become a stereotype. So you know, I was trying to be as honest as I could about something that's affected me personally in fiction, obviously. Um, and you know, because that's the way that I write. I try to bring in personal things and, and give them to fake people. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what fiction is to me. Um, referring back to what Ashley said, we know you got bullied in high school, but did this ever trigger you into having second thoughts about coming out with the book or did it motivate you? 
I mean, by the time I was like finishing the book or like even getting into the MFA, high school was so uh, far away. So, you know, the I got kicked out of high, the high school I was going to where I was getting the racism. Um, and uh, I kind of just let go of all of it pretty soon after I was, you know, like a year after that, I was like, it wasn't really getting to me and I wasn't really worried for that reason. I was, you know, it was scary to come out with a book, but I never expected it to get a ton of attention. So I thought I could quietly publish a book and get a teaching job at the, the college that I went to, the Institute of American Indian Arts, and like forced my students to read my book and that would be who would read it. Um, so everything has been a total surprise. A lot of your characters have a problem with addiction, whether it was alcohol addiction, drug addiction, or social media addiction. Have you ever experienced addiction? Yeah. Yeah, my, you know, my dad's a recovering alcoholic. Um, so is my, one of my sisters. My other sister is in late stage uh, cirrhosis. That's when basically you drink yourself to death. Right now, um, she's been drinking herself in and out of the hospital for the past year, two years. Um, and, I, and I've struggled with, with alcohol and, and drugs myself. So it's something I'm, I've had to be very aware of because it's in my family. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, everyone in my family has been affected by it. Why did you choose to end the book with violence at the powwow? And what does it mean that so many characters got hurt towards the end? So the concept, like the whole premise for the book was that there would be kind of like a cataclysmic event uh, at the end. And you would be finding out about the lives of the people who were affected by whatever happened. I didn't know what was going to happen when I thought of the book. But the, the seed, the idea for the book was always like bad shit's going to happen at the Oakland Coliseum at a powwow. So it was always, the way I was writing it was always like to get to that end point. Um, and it, you know, it sort of starts with a history of violence that this country has, um, you know, what, what this country has done to Native people it sort of outlines a history of violence. And so the end, you know, we're sort of doing it to ourselves in the end. And that is, in a lot of ways, the way colonization works. You internalize a lot of stuff and you turn it on yourself. So if I was trying to, like, make myself sound smarter than I was when I was writing the book, I might say that that's what I was doing. But really, like, I thought of that idea and then I wrote into it and I, you know, I just tried to get everybody there. But it was always going to be, you know, that was always how it was going to end in my mind. In the book, there's a chapter where Blue is hiding in the women's greyhound restroom, and um, you wrote in a character that was unnamed, unlike most of the characters that have a lot of development, that helped her out when her abuser came looking for her. And I feel, in my opinion, that this book shows a lot of the rougher sides to life. So what inspired you to um, have Blue break the cycle of women going back to their abusers? Um, you know, I, I have had a lot of strong Native women in my life, and, um, and the men uh, haven't showed up as strong, and I wanted to highlight that in the book. Um, and by the time I wrote Blue, I sort of already knew where I needed to get her to, so I I needed her to overcome this situation because uh, I knew a lot of information about her before I wrote her story. Um, but also, you know, I was writing about, like you said, this heavy material and, and missing and murdered indigenous women is like a very serious present day problem for us. Um, and I wanted her, you know, to overcome this moment. Like she's out on the highway and this is like where, where it can happen. And oftentimes because women are fleeing abusers, like they're vulnerable and, and this kind of stuff happens. And I, and I wanted her to overcome that and not necessarily like succumb to that situation. We've been hearing you uh, speak about being you know, an author, you know, you're sustaining yourself off of this. Uh, before we do that transition over to student questions, can you tell us about that story of like how you went from music over into you know, writing? It sounds like you went into it by, by accident is what you're saying. So I went to school for sound engineering at a school in Emeryville um, and kind of quickly realized that the jobs that they sort of 
are wanting you to go into from the school or like in big studios, like they had connections at the school and they were like really honest about it. It was like, you'll probably be a gopher for two years, like getting sandwiches and cleaning toilets uh, in order to get to like third engineer position in a studio. And I didn't even want to, at that point, I didn't even want to be uh, a sound engineer in a studio. I wanted to work in film, like do sound in film. And there weren't a lot of clear avenues to that and I needed a job. So I got a job at a used bookstore. Um, I had never, I was not a reader. Uh, I just somehow came across that they were hiring. Um, and at the same time, I started working at the Native American Health Center on Fruitvale and International. And so um, I, I started reading books because I was in the bookstore and there were tons of books around me. And I was like, you know, I was reading like philosophy and, and religious books and, and psychology books just to kind of like figure myself out in my 20s. Um, but fiction did something different and I, I hadn't really known. And I, I read books in high school just to get passing grades or whatever, um, but I never like saw myself in literature or saw myself writing. Um, so working at the used bookstore and, and becoming a reader for the first time, uh, I knew pretty soon after becoming a reader that I wanted to, that I wanted to write. Um, and then, you know, I got really involved for the next eight years in the native community and in storytelling projects, um, doing digital storytelling and, and traveling around the country with a nonprofit out of Berkeley. Um, and that, that all impact, impacted me in ways that show up in the book. You know, there's a storyteller at the center of it who's trying to do this project. Um, so, but I, you know, I did it on my own from like 2005 to 2014. I was just, I was working and I was writing and reading as much as I could just completely on my own. And then I got into an MFA for like the second half of writing the book. Um, and then that first book just was a hit? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was, Getting published is, you know, it's difficult. Um, and there's tons of places that I submitted to um, leading up to the moment that I was able to do this. Um, but it, it's, it's about hard work and luck and timing. And, and my book happened to, you know, the timing of it had everything to do with Standing Rock. I don't know if y'all would remember that, but it was going on uh, at the end of 2016. And then Trump got elected. And uh, a lot of people were responding that was right when my book was like going out to, I, I got an agent and at the people that sent my manuscript to my agent sent it as a call to action to like counteract this idea that we can make this country great again, like referencing like some past that never existed in this country. Um, so this would like, I, especially the prologue, like the prologue got published as a little pamphlet that people were sending out like a year ahead of the book coming out. So I think the timing of it and the, and the political moment that was happening have, have a lot to do with the, the way that it was put out and, and the success that it had. And uh, are we gonna be taking uh, a student question actually right here? Hello, my name is Jada Marie. I go to Madison Park, I'm an 11th grader. And one question I had was, during the process of the book to the end, how did you figure out who was going to live and who was going to die? Um, yeah, that, that all kind of happened. I, I was really avoiding writing the ending for a while because I didn't know. Um, and something that I, that I did on purpose, as I said earlier, the Thomas Frank chapter was, was kind of autobiographical. Um, what I did in the book, um, was to kill myself first. So he's the first one to die. And I felt like, you know, if I'm gonna be killing all these characters that the readers are getting invested in, I should kill myself first. Um, so I felt like I, I had to do that. And then, you know, it was, just came out in the writing process. It, it Whatever seemed like organically, like, like the way that it would have happened, even down to Orville and the sort of not knowing what happens. I like open-ended, uh, work because it makes the reader or the viewer, if it's a movie, it makes them engage their hope. Um, and if you if you give it to them, then they're not engage, they're not having to search in themselves if they have the hope or if they don't. Uh, so I wanted to write in the hope, like Opal at the end counts how many times the door swings, and it hits a number that she likes, and so you would you would hope that that means something, and it does. I, you know, I have an, another book coming out next year. And um, since you all have read the book, Orville Lives, I can just say that. Um, so like that was important to me 
at least to know for myself that he didn't die. Um, but other people, you know, the reason that you were getting windows into their lives leading up to the powwow is because they were going to die. So it was, I always knew that a lot of the people that you're reading about, the only reason you're even hearing about them is because they're the ones who get, who are affected by the shooting at the powwow. I cried while reading the ending of the book, and I really wanted to know if Orville lived or not. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, we got another student question right here. Hi, my name is Lola. I'm from Washington. Um, my question is, how did you decide that Orville would be a character who had to learn his, about his own culture by himself and through the internet rather than from Opal? So, um, I wanted to get into the idea that your cultural heritage and, and the history of your people or the history of one of your parents, whoever is responsible for, for passing that stuff down to you, that it's, it can be complicated by pain. So my dad, um, you know, had a lot of, had a really hard life. And he raised us in Oakland and did not, you know, he's fluent in Cheyenne, he didn't teach us our language. And he wasn't always that open about, like, you know, his past or, or he wasn't, he wouldn't, he, he was withholding because of pain, not wanting to pass on the pain. By the time I'd written, the Opal character, I realized I was, do, I was writing some version of my dad and my feelings about him, his attempt at protecting us from something that I think ultimately he couldn't protect us from. Um, and he, you know, he, he, as we got older, he, he was more, he was less reticent. Like he would talk a lot more about his history and, and you know, even more so now that he's a lot older. Um, but I wanted to explore the idea that, that a parent who would normally be responsible for passing some of that stuff on, didn't do it to protect him. And where would he go if he was curious? Uh, the internet's like full of, uh, you know, if you're a curious kid, you can find a ton of stuff on the internet. And that's, that's probably where somebody, it was just, you know, I just came up with that. Like that's probably where a kid would try to find it if they got curious enough. Thank you for joining us on the Town Talks. We'd like to thank KDOL, Oakland in the Middle, The Link, Youth Beat, Madison Park Academy, Met West High School, New Mexico Community Capital, and of course, Tommy Orange. See you next time.